Cammie and I went to Shenandoah University last week. She had an audition, a vocal audition. She's trying to become a um, music education major. She'd like to be a choir teacher, which is fun. Oh, oh got you. Thank you. I misunderstood. Um, so we were there last week. We missed you all. It's good to be back with you. We are excited to be back with you. We got to watch it online, but it's so much better to be in person. And this morning, we get to continue our Advent celebration. So last, we've done the hope candle. Last week, we did the love candle. This morning, we're going to light the joy candle. So I'm going to invite my friend Riley up. What you do with the microphone? Can I steal that from you? Because Riley is going to help me read. Last week in big church, there was a message about the shepherds. And so can you read from Luke chapter 2? You can do this one. Thank you. It's okay. Is it? oh. You were right. I need to turn it on. There you go. She said, An angel from the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds, and the glory of the God, God the Lord, sorry, shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. Uh, I bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is men- Messiah. Messiah the Lord. That's right. Thank you. Messiah just is another word. Messiah is just another word for Savior. Let's go down. Let's light the joy candle. Thank you. If anybody's looking for a microphone, I'm setting it over here. Okay, grab it. We practice this. We've got. Oh, you are so close. I know you got it. It's okay. Oh, this, why do we always choose the stubborn one? Everything else is just fine. Pull it back. There you go. We're also learning patience, joy and patience. Fabulous. Look at that. All right. Great job. Thank you, Miss Riley. All right. You are dismissed back to Kids Church. Kids can head back. Great. Well, Jesus, our Savior, is the good news. It is does bring us joy to have him around. <laughs> Oh, I see what we're doing. We're doing stickers. All right. Well, good morning. So we get to continue our series in Come, Let Us Adore Him, our Christmas series this morning. And I'm super excited to be able to do this one with you this morning. It's, um, we're going to be in Matthew 2. So if we want to head back there, we're actually going to be in, in verse 10. And we've been here before. So this is going to seem familiar. We're actually actually going to revisit our friends, the wise men, this morning. And we're going to come at this from a different perspective, take another look at this story as we dive into Let Us Adore Him, yeah? So if we look at uh, Come Let Us Adore Him, adore means that we are letting something captivate our focus, captivate our attention. And in church world, we call that worship, right? So as we come to adore him, as we come to worship him, we're allowing him to captivate our attention, to captivate our focus. And so this morning, as we come, Michael kind of alluded to it, like we're always so busy in this season because we're just adding more. It's not like we stop our normal lives. We still have to do all the things plus all the things. And so this morning, can we just stop? and bring him back into focus. Make Jesus our focus this morning. Put our focus back where it belongs. Sometimes I just have to do that. So, well, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the wise men and how we, they came close, right? We, they, taught, they taught us that we can't worship from afar. We've got to come close to worship. And last week, Scott talked about the shepherds and how God came close, right? When Jesus was born, God came close. And his nearness, what that does for us, what that, our response is, is 
phrase, and we want to share that with everybody. So we tell everybody about it when we realize, one, we come close, and two, God has come close. We get to share it with the whole world. We get to praise his name and share it. And today, as we look at the wise men again, we're going to take another perspective on worship, on adoration. This morning, can we talk about worshiping by bowing? We're going to talk about what it means to bend our knee in submission to the God of the universe. And it's something that we're not super familiar with, right? But let's, talk, let's look at the wise men in this story and what happens with them. When they saw the star, they were filled with what? Joy. They were filled with joy. Great Sunday to talk about it. And why were they filled with joy? Do you remember? Talk about a couple weeks ago. So for four centuries, wise men or magi had been waiting. There was a prophecy that there was a certain star that would shine when the Messiah, the Savior, was born. And so for four centuries, 400 years, magi or wise men, these educated men from the east, were watching the sky. And one night, the star appeared. They've been watching and waiting and watching and waiting, and they'd heard about it for centuries from wise men of old. And then the star appears, and they are excited and filled with joy because here is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And so they head out to Bethlehem to meet the child, right? And they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they, what did they do? Let's actually read this together bowed down and worshiped. Yes, they bowed down and worshiped him. That's awesome. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of the wise men, I don't know if you can see this, but whenever you go to buy a set, if you go to Target and buy a nativity set, they sell these sets with Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in a manger and a shepherd and a couple sheep, maybe a goat if you're getting a fancy one, and the wise men, and a camel, if you're getting the fancy one, right? They all come in a set. So when we think of the wise men, we think of them maybe bowing down and worshiping next to a little crib, next to a little manger, and giving their gifts to little two-week-old baby Jesus, yeah? That's the image sometimes we get in our head. And some of you may or may not know, but that's probably not how it happened, because there was a star in the sky that shone that announced the birth of this baby. And so these wise men were about 900 miles away. And there were no planes or trains or automobiles in those days. There were camels. So they had to make it 900 miles to Bethlehem via camel. Somebody do the math. How long does it take to take a big procession of men and gifts and camels 900 miles? About two years, scholars say. So the assumption is when they entered into Mary's house and they entered into the house and they saw Mary and her child, that Jesus probably wasn't a two-week-old little cute baby, but he was probably a toddler, yeah? And so the fact that these guys got on a camel and they spent two years going to this destination, one, it tells me a couple things. I mean, it tells me a couple things. One is that they saw this star and they must have known that they known that they known. Like, they, they must have just known this is it. This is the sign, right? It must have been obvious to them that, okay, we got to hop on our camels. Let's go because we got to go meet this king, this Messiah, this Savior, right? Because I don't know about you, but, like, sometimes I get in the car and I go to Kroger and they don't have what I want and I'm irritated and I have to go home. And that's a 20-minute inconvenience. These guys, two years on a camel, what if Mary and Joseph had moved to the suburbs of Bethlehem? Like, what if they missed him? Like, what if they couldn't find him? It's a, not just a two-year commitment because they've got to get back home. This is a four-year commitment, right? So this is a big deal, something that doesn't really, we don't register. We wouldn't do that today, right? I digress. They were committed. They had faith. They did a big thing. But I don't want us to miss this, the other part of this too, right? The two-year-old part. Jesus was a toddler. Has anybody ever spent significant time with a two-year-old? Yeah, I have. I got three of them. And I can tell you this with certainty. Most two-year-olds are not little angels, right? They're figuring out language. They're figuring out mobility. They're figuring out independence. And 
They're not angels. So these men got on camels, drove 900 miles of via two, over two years to get there, and they, here they get with this toddler. Now, I mean, we can talk about Christmas miracles, right? Some people have an issue with a virgin birth. Okay, it's complicated. I get that. But this one coming and worshiping at the feet of a toddler, like, Listen, y'all, I've had toddlers, and they're not cute angel babies. When I was young, before we had kids, I was super judgmental. Hopefully I'm better. But I thought, when I'm a parent, my kids aren't going to act like that. When I'm, a, when I'm a parent, my kids, by two, he's going to be potty trained. He's going to eat what I put in front of him. He's not going to take that voice with me. He will say, yes, mom, or whatever it was in Hebrew or <laughs> Aramaic. Um, he will, my house will be clean. Like, why isn't your house clean? Like, what do you do all day? Um, right? Like, these are the things that go through your head. And then you have a munchkin and the two-year-old, and you realize it's like a hostage negotiation. Listen, mom has to sleep. I just need to feel like I'm a human, right? Can you please just go to sleep? What is it going to take, right? So we get into this situation where, Like, this is a miracle in and of itself that they're coming and they bow down at the feet of a toddler. So we got some strange things happening. These guys travel 900 miles via camel, two years, and then they worship at the feet of a toddler. Not adult King Jesus, which would make sense to us in our mindset. Not cute little baby Jesus, because that's what we picture in all the nativity scenes, but a toddler. Okay, that's different. The other thing that I want to point out that's different here is they bowed, right? For us, in our society, in our culture, that's not something you see day to day. Like if you walked around, if we walked around here today and just started bowing to each other, I'd be a little weird, right? It's not, it's not something we do in our Western culture. Now, granted, around the world today, bowing still exists. It's still something people do in different cultures, yes? In Asian cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, in some African cultures, people still bow today. And we know in our culture, we've seen the movies, we know historically Western society bowed, but it's something that's faded out of our culture. So we just don't go around bowing. We've lost what that means to bow to someone because of their position or their authority or in submission. We just don't get that. Now, that's not to say that we don't do body language, right? Because every day, all day, right, we are reading other people's body language. Body language is how we communicate. I, we don't have to say anything to each other. and We can have a full conversation just with body language, yeah? And so it's interesting to me that even though we don't do bowing in our culture, we still use body language. There is a study about a decade ago. Um, about body language and how we communicate through it. Um, have you guys ever heard of power posing? It, was, it came out of this study. The research said that it showed like kind of the things, like these are the ways that you can show confidence and these are the ways that people show lack of confidence, right? So as we're standing around, how we stand communicates how we're feeling. So people without confidence, right? Their posture, slouched, shoulders humped, right? They don't make eye contact, yeah? Head down sometimes. What else? Um, Like arms, not like angry, because that's a way we communicate, but maybe protecting ourselves, fidgeting. Something that's interesting, they don't show their hands, yeah? So people, if if we're not confident, we hide our hands, yeah? Yeah. the thing that one of the things that got me too was like the giveaway for you're not feeling confident, touching your neck, which makes sense when you think about it, right? Like at our core, we want to protect. Like, hey, don't. These are like where all of my important things are. <laughs> like, don't mess with those. So, and the flip side, they did the counterpart of that is they showed like these are the things that show confidence, that show power. And obviously, posture, eye contact, right? Being able to carry yourself like that. And then they talked about a a few poses, which are called power poses, that show the confidence. And we're familiar with these. When somebody crosses the finish line in a big race or they make a touchdown, what do they do? Like this, 
yeah, right? Big, we're victory, yes? This is power, I'm confident. Uh, what does this communicate at the end of a race? Picture this, he just won, right? Like, we get this. Um, power pose, we can talk superpowers, and we can call the Superman or the Wonder Woman pose. If you see somebody standing like this, one, it's a little awkward, they're probably a little bit more relaxed, but wide feet, taking up space, right? When you, when you feel confident, you take up more room. When you don't feel confident, you shrink yourself, yeah? So this is a power pose. And power poses, confidence isn't communicated just through standing. When somebody's sitting, maybe, you know, your boss is sitting at his desk and he's got his hands behind his head and he's got his feet up on the desk, yeah? What's that say? I own this space. I'm in charge here. I have nothing to worry about, right? And some of you, I look around the room, sitting, you can express confidence like this with your, hand, with your arm over the side of the chair. I belong here. This is my space. I fit in here. Yeah? It's confident. This, you guys ever have a teacher in high school who did this all the time? It's a power pose, right? I'm leaning into your space, right? I'm in charge. Like, this is my space. So those are some of the things, right? So we, we understand nonverbal communication. We may not bow, but we get it. You and I could sit together and do a social experiment and just people watch. And we could probably pick out a conversation between a boss and their superior, or their in, subordinate, not superior, they're, right? So see the person in authority and the person who answers to them just by body language, yeah? You and I could probably do that fairly easy, easily. The crazy thing is, is that our body language not only communicates to other people. So the way I'm standing not only communicates about me to you, but how I'm standing actually communicates to me. Have you ever like been standing like, oh wow, like I'm really slouched. My posture's really bad. You know, I feel like an imposter. I don't fit here, right? But if you're standing and you're confident, you, your posture's better, you know, like, I belong. I got this. So the study showed that we can actually change our own mindset, our own mood, by the way we are posturing ourselves. And I've taught this to students before. Like, when you go into this interview, you're going go to your, go to the bathroom or in the elevator or whatever by yourself. Don't do this out in public. And you're going to do the victory pose. Like, do this. Because in the study, it said this. It said, listen, when you do this and you own it, make yourself big. As I'm doing this, my confidence is increasing. My cortisol, my stress hormone is decreasing. Scientifically, I am becoming more confident, right? So before you go into a sales pitch or before you go into your job performance review, find a place and be silly, but own it. I'm good. I know my job. I got this, right? Because it, ch it changes. Your, your body can change your mind, how we position our bodies, how we posture ourselves can affect the way we think. Isn't it funny or awesome how science can back up 3,500 years of what the Word of God teaches us? Right? Because when we're looking at the Word of God clear back in the Old Testament, we see that positioning our bodies prepares us for what's coming next. How we position and posture ourselves prepares us for what's coming next. Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7 say this, and you may know this from the song because it's a good song. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker, for he is our God. Let us worship. How are we going to worship? We're going to bow down and kneel. And why? Because he's God. Our posture reminds us of his position, right? And our bodies help to affect our thinking. Listen, that Hebrew word for bow that's there, it's used in scripture over 170 times. It means bow low, kneel in humble submission. It means changing our posture. It's an understanding of status, 
of who God is and who we aren't to physically change our posture in recognition of his status. And we see this when the wise men enter into the presence of the Messiah, the King, even as a toddler. They recognize his position and the honor and reverence that he's due, and they bow down and they worship and adore him. And the Bible invites us to change our posture when we come into the presence of God. Over and over, to bow our hearts, to bow our head. The New, the New Testament word for worship, literally translated in the Greek, it means to position your face towards the ground. So we're invited over and over again to position ourselves to worship, to bow down, bow our heads, bow our hearts, bow our knees in submission to the God of the universe. And sometimes in our society, we kind of get stuck in this mindset of God's my buddy. He's my friend. And it's true. He is our friend. And he is holy. And he is without sin. And he is the creator of all things. And he is the Messiah, the Savior, the King, the King of Kings. So when we come into his presence, what do we enter in like? Blessing. Moses was told by God himself, look, you can't handle all this. He said, don't, don't even try. He said, cover your face because when I come by, you can peek, but don't look at me. Right? Moses, the guy who saw the burning bush, heard God's audible voice, wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets, parted the Red Sea. He changed his posture when he came into the presence of God. When we enter into the presence of God, how do we posture ourselves? In the Old Testament, when the priests would enter into the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence dwelled, before he went in, they'd tie a rope around his waist, send him in. And then they'd wait for the allotted time. And after a bit, if he didn't come out in time, what would they do? They'd pull the rope because they thought that God's presence was so magnificent that this person, just like Moses, may not live through being in his presence. And so they have to pull him out, Right? And once we wrap our minds around the fact that God is so holy and so magnificent that there are times we can't even look at him or be in his presence, right? It changes how we respond to being in his presence. It changes how we posture ourselves. And this is how the wise men entered into the presence of toddler Messiah Jesus. They are in such awe they bowed down and worshiped. How cool is that? They had no instruction, no manual, right? Nobody said, hey, go find the baby, bow down, you know? Like they didn't get any of that. It's what happens, the only response, when they see a star that was prophesied 400 years ago appear, and they thought, this is it. The Messiah has been born. Here he is. Let's go. And they waited for two years to meet him. And when they did, they fell to their knees because it was the only response that seemed appropriate when you meet the king of kings. They bowed down. Listen, what if this Christmas season, this season of our lives, and honestly, for the rest of our lives, what if we thought about the way that we enter into his presence when we're worshiping? Whose presence are we entering into? Because it'll change the, it'll change our our posture, right? Whether we lift our hands in praise, whether we lift our hands in submission, whether we bow our knee in worship, or we stand or we sit or we change our posture, however that may be, in recognition of this is different. We're in a different space. I'm recognizing who God is, right? We should always be challenged by whose presence we're entering into. like the wise men, right? 
And we come ready. We come ready to change our posture in the presence of God. We come ready to worship. We come ready to adore. We come ready. And what better time to be confronted by the immensity of this God that we are serving, that we are worshiping, than Christmas. A season where we celebrate the fact that God came near. God joined us here as a baby. Not born into a palace, not born into wealth, not born into prestige, but born as a baby in a manger. That's crazy. He was born to eventually die a criminal's death. So we wouldn't have to. In fact, we get to live with him forever in heaven because of what he did. And when we recognize what he did and who he is, it changes how we respond to him, even in our posture. To change our posture is to recognize who he is and what he's done. It's an act of adoration. It's an act of humility of humbling ourselves. 1 Peter 5 says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. We bow down and he lifts us up. When we change our posture to worship God, it's a recognition of his position. You're bigger, you're greater. It's making ourselves vulnerable, right? It's giving up control. No, no. It's not giving up control. It's recognizing who is in control, right? And it's giving up whatever little control we think we have. And it's giving up the anxiety over the fact that we don't think we have control. That's okay. Because it recognizes who's in control God is. When we change our position, our posture, it's the mission. It's submitting to God and to God's will. It's worship. If we enter his presence like the wise men did and we recognize whose presence that we're in, we change our posture. But what if we're not ready? Right? Sometimes we're not. This season. We do all the things plus all the things. And sometimes we're just, and we're just not ready. I'm not in the mood. I'm not in the mindset. I'm not there. Scripture tells us over and over again, that when we change our posture, that, that, that to adjust our posture, not when, but to do it. Scripture says over and over again, adjust your posture. It says bow. It says praise. It says dance. It says raise your hands. It says stand. It says kneel. It says lay prostrate on the, fo- on the floor, right? Because our bodies can change our mind. How we posture ourselves is connected to how we think. And so when my mind is distracted, I can lead with my body. If we're standing in worship and I'm not feeling it, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes you come in and you just didn't have the best conversation in the car with whoever is in the car with you. So you're like, nope, not feeling it. And you sit on your phone in the seat. Or you can put your phone down and you can stand up. You can change your posture, right? You can raise your hand and let your Let your mind and your heart follow your body. Lead, like, okay, all right, here we are. Oh, yeah, that's right. You sit on a throne. (laughs) I don't, okay, right? It helps me shift my focus. I can bow my head. I can lift my hands. I can bend my knee. I can bow. 170 times the word tells us to bow in honor and submission and recognition, right? In reverence. So we position ourselves in front of the Holy One, the Creator, the King. And however we do that, we change our posture. And when we do, it resets our priorities. And when you shift your body to do something, like it reshifts your priorities. It helps us to get into alignment and put things in the proper order. Oasis family, let's enter into his presence today. Worship team, you can come on up this season, this next year, in the heart of adoration, ready to be in his presence. Listen, it took the, t- the wise men two years to prepare to be in his presence. And the day that they met him, they dropped to a knee and they bowed and they worshiped. 
two years. Sometimes I, I need to be reminded, I think we probably all do, that it doesn't take us two years. Because of Jesus, we have relationship with him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We are never outside of his presence. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. When we want to enter into his presence, he's already there. He's just like, hey, glad you looked up, right? So we just need to remind ourselves he's already here. We need to be reminded that he's called us to live the life he wants. And it's not comfortable, but it's worship. It's surrender. Not my will, but yours be done, Lord. It's a posture of understanding whose presence I'm in, who's in charge, who ultimately calls the shots. Praise God, it's not me. And it isn't easy. But neither is a 900-mile camel ride to go worship a toddler, right? Neither is being obedient to the point of death on the cross. So, Oasis, this Christmas, let's adore him. Let's allow him to consume our focus. Let's press into his will. And when we worship, let's change our posture. So we're going to do that today. We're going to stand. It's one of the reasons why we say, let's stand and pray and enter into worship. God, you are the God of the universe. You are our friend, but you are also holy. You are the King of Kings. You are our Savior. You are our Messiah. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in the fact that we have your presence with us always. We are grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen.